class. Welcome to Advantage. I'm Dr. Jody Richardson Delgado, and we're going to be talking about Psych 101. This is part two of the research videos. So, when we talk about research, um, one of the biggest areas of research that we do in psychology is experimentation, and we like to do experiments. Experiments are one of the ways that we can show cause and effect. Now, this requires us to look at a population that we want to study. Often it's people, but it could be animals. It could be anything that has to do with behavior and mental process. And so we're looking at a population of people, and now we need to find a sample from that population. So if I want to look at drivers, for example, I want to be sure that my sample are also drivers as well, people who have driver's license. I don't want to take people who don't have a driver's license, or maybe I'm looking at a specific age range. That's going to be important too for my sample to be within that age range so that I can take the results of my study and apply them to the population. Now, in, in an experiment, we have independent variables, and these are the variables that the researcher is interested in looking at. So we might have one group that runs a course in a certain type of car, and another group that runs that same course in a, a truck. And what we're doing with that independent variable is we're changing the groups that people are in. We're changing one variable of the difference between those two groups. Now the dependent variable is what we're trying to measure. So maybe we want to measure brake time reaction in those different types of cars. So do people brake differently in a truck than they do in a small car? And that's the dependent variable. It's what the researcher is trying to measure. Now we can also have control groups and we often see this when we are trying to do some type of maybe therapeutic intervention or where we control for some type of variable that is going to impact the study in some way. The experimental group is the group that actually receives the experiment. So, in our example here, we have a sample of participants from a driving population, and we randomly assign them to the control or the experimental group, and we measure their brake reaction time. So what we might wanna do in a case like this is get a group of people that have a driver's license and also use cell phones, because we might wanna test what brake reaction is when people are texting and driving versus people who are not texting and driving. And so what we'll do is we'll take a population of people that use cell phones as well as have a driver's license. We also wanna look at what is the age range possibly of the people that we're looking at. We might not want to have a group of 16 year olds in one in the control group and a group of 80 year olds in the other group. So we may want to look at a specific age range, those people that are most likely to be texting and driving, people who maybe are in their 20s, so 20 to 29 year olds. So we take a sample of people and we put them in a same, the same car. So the car needs to be designed very similarly or exactly the same, and we'll have them drive through a course. One group will have a cell phone and will be texting. The other group will not have a cell phone and be driving. Now, we will have them go through the same course and maybe we'll put some obstacles in their way and watch what their break reaction time is and we'll measure that. Once we get that break reaction time, then we can mathematically compare, is there a significant difference between these two groups? And you can imagine that, yes, in fact, there is a significant difference between people who text and drive and their break reaction time and people who are not texting and driving while they are trying to break. Now, there's some things that we have to consider when we are setting up an experiment. We have to consider confounding variables. So it's important when we were doing a study like what I was just describing, that we don't have one group drive maybe on a rainy day and another group drive on a sunny day because a confounding variable is something that would interfere with the results of the study. So that's gonna be the rain. In that situation, the rain could be a confounding variable. Um, the type of car could be a confounding variable. That's why we need to have them drive in the same type of car. So we have to do a lot of controls with the experiment. We also have to be careful with selection bias. 
This is one of the reasons why we use random selection. So we get a group of people and we randomly assign them to the control group or the experiment group. And often the researcher doesn't know ahead of time which group people are going to be and they just randomly assign them to both. And that takes out some of the bias that the experimenter might have towards their hypothesis because we want to keep out the experimenter bias as much as possible when we do these types, this type of research. The other thing that we need to be aware of is when we are actually displaying our data. This goes back to that critical thinking element that I was talking about in the last video. When we are consuming information and we are consuming research, we have to really look at what is it that is being presented to me. Now you see these two graphs in front of you what is the difference? There really isn't any difference in the data that's being presented to you. It's actually the scale that you see. One is zero to 10, the other is zero to 20, and you see two in between. So that's important to know what is it that I'm looking at and what message might the author or the advertiser be trying to tell me. Another thing that is important for our field is ethics. We need to follow the laws. We need to follow federal, state, and any guidelines that we have from our institution. We also have to get institutional approval in order to be able to do our research. There's something called the IRB, which is the Institutional Review Board that many education institutions, as well as hospitals and many places of business have, where you have to submit your research and say what it is that you're going to do, and then they have to approve it. We can't just go in and start doing research. We have to get consent from the institution that we work for or are with, and also the institution that we want to actually do our research in. We also have to provide informed consent to the participants that are in our study. So our participants need to know what is going to happen and what the possible outcome and ramifications for their participation are in our studies. And then we also have to be careful about deception. Now we're going to go through a lot of studies in this class where we have used some deception and deception can only be used as a last resort. We try to do anything besides deception, but there are times when it does need to be used. Often if we use deception, then we have to come at the end of the study and actually have a debriefing. And this is where we actually talk to our participants and kind of explain what happened and why we deceived them. Where do we find these studies? Well, you can find them in libraries. You can certainly find them in colleges and universities in their databases that they have there. We go to conferences and we present our research and we listen to the research of others as well. You can also go to internet sources. You can go to Google Scholar and actually Google some of the research that is out there, as well as the American Psychological Association also has some resources available. So you can see what some of the journal articles and journals are that are out there in psychology. So that concludes our two-part series on research methods. I hope to see you next time.